Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. So glad to see you all here. Uh, we have a very exciting Writer's Bridge planned for tonight. Really excited to have you. I recorded to the cloud, right? Did I hit record to the cloud and not record to this computer? Recording in progress. It just says recording in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, fingers crossed. <laughs> I have I have once accidentally listed record to this computer instead of record to the cloud. And the difference is it shows you the full gallery view rather than just the speaker view when you record to your computer. And that was the one time that one of our lovely attendees who shall remain nameless changed her top without realizing her camera was on and it was like a full boob extravaganza i had to end up editing the video <laughs> oh man zoom is we are our looking lives. out for you guys we are looking out for you that you shall not be be accidentally showing your boobs to the world and remember everybody always double check whether or not your camera is on it's ruined some careers it really has <laughs> Welcome, welcome. Brian, we are so glad you're here. It's been a while since we've seen you. And Brian, congratulations. You just got a recent publication. Brian, will you unmute and tell us what is your cool, exciting new recent publication that's a super, super big deal? You'll need to unmute yourself. Yes, I keep pressing, pressing, pressing. Um, so it's upcoming uh, in May, um, an essay that I wrote uh, will be featured in the Emerging oh. Writing Series for uh, Roxane Gay's The Audacity. Wonderful. Hooray, hooray, hooray! That is fantastically awesome. Congratulations. And Brian, yeah. since tonight we are talking about emerging as a writer, do you feel like you're emerging? Are you a beautiful butterfly? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> and and I, you know, cling to that metaphor because I am queer and queer people emerge all the time. So yes. Awesome. <sighs> so we're we're emerging in in many ways, which is good, which is super, super good. Hello, hello, hello. Hey, Mubina, do me a favor and WhatsApp me when you get a chance because there is a Dubai writers group that is primarily women that I keep meaning to add you to on WhatsApp and I keep forgetting and then I couldn't find your number on WhatsApp and I know you have my number. So will you please WhatsApp me when you get a chance? Thanks. Welcome, welcome. So glad to have you all here. Um, and we'd like to invite you, go ahead and weigh in in the chat. Where are you coming in from? What are you currently writing? And do you feel like you're emerging? Does emerging feel like it's happening for you? We are so absolutely delighted to have you here. Um, let us uh, talk today about what it means to be an emerging writer, how you personally can burst out of your cocoon, bring your words to the world. We have a super, super special guest today, someone who got scouted by an editor and uh, has turned her memoir into a middle grade novel, which is kind of awesome. And she's defining herself in the world as a writer. We're going to talk about how that all happened and how you can make it happen for you and get your work into the world. So before we dive into our main event, hey, Sharla, what's coming up with Craft Talks webinars? And in the meanwhile, one quick second while I hit mute all, and then Sharla, you're going to need to unmute yourself again. Did it. Thank there you. There we go. Dynamite. Yeah, actually, this really kind of fits like a glove because Rebecca Morrison's going to be joining us tomorrow on Craft Talks as well, doing um, a webinar, Writing for Commercial Publications, Find the Right Fit for Your Work. And I'm sure you're going to hear more about that later on. And also, Does It Have to Be Memoir? Reimagine Your True Story with Beth Kephart is on April 3rd. There's much more on the website. So if you're interested, I'll pop that information in the chat. And Allison, what's coming up for you? Well, I am super excited. I've got a proposal boot camp coming up April 12th through 14th. It is a three-day live event. Um, Abby Alton Schwartz, I see, is here. And Abby is also going to be weighing in with how her proposal is out there in the world and getting shopped around to publishers, even as we speak. Um, we're going to look at how do you actually write that memoir or nonfiction proposal. And over the course of the three days of the live on Zoom event, you will actually write the vast majority of your your proposal. So it is going to be a super fun weekend. And you may have noticed in the most recent Writer's Bridge email that if you use code BRIDGE, you get 50 bucks off, which is kind of fun just for our community. 
Um, so I have just finished teaching in Santa Fe as well. I got to take an urban sketching retreat and I got to tell you guys, it is so good to study something you are bad at. Like, I don't know about you guys, but if I go to a writing retreat, I feel like, Ooh, I better be the best in class or people are going to think I'm not worth it. I better be good. I better be good at what I do. And taking a sketching retreat, like I only cried three times when it like did not look the way I needed it to look. And I had to redo it on a completely new sheet of paper, but I learned so much and it was so like low pressure. So I highly, highly recommend doing something you're bad at because it is way less stressful. Charlotte, will you introduce our amazing guest? Yes. And I really, I'm really glad you started with that, Allison, because I think when it comes to being an emerging writer, it has a lot to do with this tenuous thing between being a master at what you do and also being failing at what you do. So I'm glad that you brought that up because um, I think it's really pertinent to what we're probably going to discuss today. So let me go ahead and introduce Rebecca. Rebecca Morrison is a lawyer, writer, and editor. Her work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Huff Post, the Today Show, Newsweek, NBC News, Salon, The Independent, among others. She's completing a middle grade novel based on her childhood as an Iranian immigrant trying to fit into her family, school, and new American homeland. She started an adult novel, and she's here to talk about emerging as a writer. Welcome, Rebecca. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much, Sharla and Allison. I'm excited to be here. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, what, I, what is, uh, go yes. ahead. I was going to ask you your first question. Do which it. Is, Love it. What is emerging writer when i say that what does that make you think of um and do you identify as an emerging writer maybe that was presumptuous i do i do you know i'll just tell you a little bit about how i got here i um i spent 20 over 20 years being a lawyer and i'll tell you a quick story like 10 maybe 10 years ago i was sitting in the car with a girlfriend of mine that i walk with once or twice a week and I was really unhappy and um, just flailing, like I did. I felt unmoored in my life. And she said, well, what is the one thing you would wish to do if you could do anything? And I told her, I remember this like it was yesterday, sitting next to her in, in her car. And I said, I'd love to write a memoir, but I know I can never do it. And I knew in my gut in that moment, I would never do it because of all the things that um, I don't, you know, I didn't know how to really write well. I didn't, uh, I didn't know how I would bring it up with my family, all the things that we're, we have doubts about and we're scared about. How would I even start something so humongous? So 10, about, you know, uh, eight, 10 years go by and we have COVID and I, uh, I had a legal contracting job with the same company I've had, and I still work with them now. But during COVID, they laid off a third of their workers and they left off, laid off their, uh, you know, fired their contractors. I was a contractor. And I had for the first time really nothing in terms of work. And I took a class. I just said, I'm going to jump on. And I just Googled writing class. I mean, that's simple. Um, and I found Peter Mountford's, um, it was called advanced essay writing. And I thought, okay, I'm not advanced, but you know, I like to shoot high. And so I, I took that class and it changed my life. And that was about three years ago. Um, I took his class and in, in, from there, I did all these other things, you know, that came into my life. So I am an emerging writer. I'm a newish writer, but I went into it full force. Like once I started, I just thought I'm 50. It was, I, I had just turned 50 right before I turned 50. And I said, I'm not stopping for anything. I am going forward. People told me all the time, I'm telling you this, if there's any new writers in the group, I would um, talk to friends, lovely friends, supportive friends. They would say, oh, you have to pay your dues for years. You're not going to be in the Washington Post. You're not going to be in big publications. Those are the best writers in the world. It, it takes decades to get in there. It doesn't take decades. It could take a much shorter time. It's not guaranteed, but anything is possible. That's the amazing thing. You and know, I Rebecca, you you remind me of that where many, many years ago when I was a young and not super healthy adult, um, I was working in, let us say, exotic dance establishments. And what older girls used to tell newer girls is, oh no, you can't go work at that club. They have a weight requirement. 
Nobody ever had a weight requirement. Everybody was perfectly happy to welcome any young woman who was willing to joyfully dance around in a minimum of clothing. <laughs> and yet there are these fake barriers that are set up for us, even by the people who care about us that, you know, oh, we don't want Rebecca to get hurt. So we're just going to tell her to lower her expectations. 100% all the time. It really happened quite often. I had very few people that said, why not you? Why can't you be in the New York Times? And I'd say, but I haven't, I don't know anything. How would I even do it? So I started with one writing class and just Google. Mm -hmm. And I, I get people email me uh, quite often now. How do I find this editor? Or how do I Google, take a couple minutes be a detective, which I, that's one of my slides tomorrow for the pitch class. Um, the class tomorrow is how do I get my essays into big national publications, which was my number one goal. Because when I started writing in this writing class, um, they, um, I knew kind of like this was the beginning. I'm going to do it. I'm going to write this memoir. But then who's going to publish this memoir? I, I didn't even know you needed an agent. So they're like, you need an agent. And this is how it works. OK, fine. How am I going to find an agent? They said, there's only a couple of ways. One, this is what they told me. This is all from my, they said, one, you need an enormous platform. I knew I couldn't do that. I'm not that kind of person. I can't have a hundred thousand followers. I can't do it. Two, they said, you need like award-winning uh, writing and like the Sun or Paris Review. That's really, you know, literary works that like you get awards for. Um, and I, and I wasn't sure about that either. But the third thing was get attention in big national publications. And I mm -hmm. thought to myself, I don't know if I can do it, but that's something I can, that's, I'm going to dive into that one, number three. And that's how I got my agent. So Rebecca, you said that you knew that this was an advanced course. Yes. What, what was, what was the, the feeling when you joined? Did you feel like you know, did you feel like that this was a place that was welcoming to you or did you feel like, oh, I'm just going to shoot for the stars and see where I land afterwards? That's a good, that's a great question, you know, um, and same with when I I'm also a painter. So when I started taking um, drawing classes, I felt the same way, like, wow, there are these people that are so much better than me. Um, but when I took Peter's class, I was I would say in the bottom third. Um, but it was great to see these top, you know, gorgeous writers, and it really made me want to meet me, me want to join them. It made me want to learn from them. And Peter was a very patient teacher, and he was. Um, uh, I like his toughness. Mm -hmm. He um, he told it like it was, and then um, let you do the homework. So I just did it. I did the work. Yeah, Peter Mountford and is great. Yeah. And let me jump in there too. Like if you are in a writing group or a class and check in with your own, like honesty, rather like, don't, don't think you're being arrogant or braggy, just check in with your own honesty and go, okay, do I feel like I'm the best writer in this class? Because if you are, you need a harder class. Oh, it's yes. time to level up. Yeah. We play better tennis by playing with better tennis players. We yeah. write better by being around better writers. Um, so I would strongly, strongly encourage you, level up, get into a class where there's at least one person who you think, man, that person's work is so good. I feel intimidated by it yes. because it will make you reach a little harder. It will make you work a little more and you will find yourself looking more specifically at their work and going, well, what is making them right. better than me? So Rebecca, do you feel like you are emerging as a writer on purpose? Because you're definitely putting in the work. I know you send a lot of pitches for every pitch that gets accepted. True. How much is coming from your choices and actions and how much is out of your control? It's just been a lucky break. It's been good timing. What, what do you feel like the balance is on that? That's a great, great question. I think it's both. I really, you know, I am from Iran. So I started writing my story, immigrant, belonging, identity, things that um, really meaningful to me. I also had a mother who wanted me to be thin and did a lot of hard, dark things for me to be thin. So I developed an eating disorder, fought, fought you know, the world to accept who I was and refused to believe what she said. I wanted to be 
to believe that I was worthwhile. And so I loved America because I thought it was different than my own culture, but the truth is the world, everywhere in the world, we have to fight. Um, so I had these, I think these lucky beats as Allison, as I learned from Allison, one of her uh, craft talks or um, uh, webinars, I don't know, I took everything Allison had, uh, um, I still do. And she said, you know, stick with your beat. And I did. Those were my beats. And I'm lucky that my beats, immigrant, um, identity, belonging, mother, daughter, weight issues, eating disorders, those are things that resonate with a lot of people. So in that way, I was lucky. And some of those things hit really far and wide. My two viral pieces, one of them was about being an American and what that means and something that happened to me and how I defined myself first negatively and then positively. My second piece that went viral in the Today Show website was purely mother-daughter. How does a mother and daughter have, how do they have a relationship when the mother um, doesn't unconditionally love the way you are? They want you to be different because they think that's the right way to be. And so um, I wrote that piece and it has nothing, like the two were very separate and both of them kind of hit that core message that people could say they saw themselves in that. Um, and so part of it, I think was really drive. I did not take no for an answer. I uh, pitched so many people before I took a pitching class, before I, I knew how to do anything, I would just email editors that I would find on Google completely blind. And 90% of the time they didn't respond to my emails um, or once in a while they'd email me back like 5% of the time. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm going somewhere because somebody's responding to my email. But like sometimes because the piece had been, I'd worked on the piece in the class or like after class, I'd really worked on it. The piece was uh, good. And an editor would be like, she knows, you know, she hasn't done anything, but the piece is good. Like Noah Mickelson at HuffPost. I hadn't done any pieces and he took that piece and it changed my life. Mm. So is that how you first started pitching? I mean, how did you first start pitching? Yeah. What gave you the idea? Honestly, uh, I started just going to a website. Um, I wanted, I wanted the top websites, even though I hadn't, didn't, didn't, hadn't done anything, but so I'd go to the Washington Post, go to the masthead, go to the bottom, um, email, uh, just Google editor, parenting, Washington Post, who's the editor, um, figure out how to get their email, um, and then email them. What I did at the beginning was a little bit rough. It was very amateur, my pitching. Um, I always tried to be polite, but in short, I figured, I figured they, that, you know, they're not going to want a long pitch. But I really didn't know how to do it. And through the process of taking classes, I took Susan Shapiro's pitch class, which was really good. And I'll, t I'll shout out to Abby. I had already published a bunch of stuff. Um, and I had heard about Susan Shapiro. She does this pitch class where she brings in editors um, on her Zoom class and you get to meet the editors. And I said to Abby Schwartz, um, I said, do you think I should take this class? I already know how to get my stuff published. And she said, absolutely. And that's another lesson. It's, I think we can constantly be learning, constantly be taking these, these classes. I don't take as many classes as I used to, but I will jump on a craft talks. I will jump on, I take, I join almost every writer's bridge if I can. Um, I think each time we get a nugget of information, it really helps to grow our um, knowledge about this industry. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I have to say, as the administrator of Craft Talks, I feel like my MFA is just continuing. I don't feel like I've gotten yeah. to the point where I'm a master of everything I've ever heard. It just continues to build. It's a, it's a good advice. Yeah, awesome. and Go Deborah ahead, Lucas awesome. mentions in the chat too that she trained as a book coach and she now feels like she's learning so much from her clients too. And yes. I love that. I love that there are a whole bunch of subjects that I know just enough about because I had to look it up and research it to be able to, to serve a client. Um, we have a great question in the chat for you, Rebecca, from Abby. What about the role of community in your achievements? Uh, we know that's big for you. How does your community help your achievements and your writing life? That is such a great question. I'll say this, 
besides taking classes, the most important and even maybe more important or the same, I don't know, is the community I found right at the beginning of this process. I met one person, Hannah Grieco. I hope I'm saying her last name right. Hannah, um, and I found it on, when I was Googling classes, I also went on Facebook and I was trying to see who's a writer and she was doing this um, workshop and I took her workshop and I saw in her bio that she's on Twitter. And I thought, I haven't, I opened an account like five years ago, I've never been on. I went on and just followed her, one person. And I fell in love, 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 love. I fell in love with Twitter. I know it's not a popular thing to say, but <laughs> I just- I followed every writer. I read every piece. And um, the community, the writer's community on these social media web uh, platforms, and for me, Twitter is the most powerful one, is incredible. I'm, you know, I've been a lawyer. I've been, I've done a lot of stuff. I've never seen people help each other in the way that they do, or they have for me on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. And within those first weeks of being on Twitter, it's totally true. I, um, you know how Twitter does spaces. It's like a conference call of Twitter. I don't know. I used to do that. I, I saw it said women writers and I was in the car with my husband and I said, I'm just going to click on this, sweetie. Just don't say anything. I think it's a, I, I couldn't, I didn't know. I thought it was a conference call. And I get on and it was Abby and Megan, two wonderful writers that were leading a women's writing discussion on writing memoirs. And I fell in love with this group and we still talk almost every day on uh, on our group. And we encourage each other and we, we share life's uh, issues. It's really, a community is everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the support they give you, like on Twitter, I'll tell you, and I'm talking about this tomorrow also, a lot of the leads, a lot of the, uh, that I get for pieces, a lot of the editors I've become, you know, knowledgeable about, a couple of editors I've become genuinely good friends with, all on Twitter, because you get to know who they are read their pieces, read what they publish, read what they care about. Sometimes you think this person is not, you know, not the same as me. And other times you think we could be twins right. and it just really connects. And that'll come through when you email them. You don't have to say much, but if you say, oh, I, I saw that piece you published and it was beautiful. That's enormous. That's an yeah, enormous solution. But it's also not people often do. They don't often find um the time to reach out to other people and i think that makes a big difference we're none of us are doing anything on our own um I, we have a question in the chat real quick um from Catherine who says do you write a piece and look for a place to pitch it or target an outlet and write a pitch for a timely piece that's that's a great question i did what you know in my gut i always wanted to just write what what was it you know most important to me because i waited all these years to write so when the floodgates opened. I said, you know, I had all these stories that were bursting out of me. And Peter Manford does something great in his class. If you end up taking his class, he makes us twice during the, like, I don't know, I don't know, five weeks, eight weeks. I can't remember. He makes you brainstorm some of the most important, like stories in your life. So it's one paragraph brainstorm. So he says, do five at a time. I, I, I think I've published every single one I brainstormed in his class because those were like those those stories that were sitting inside waiting to come out. So I write, and this is not, not everybody does this. In fact, I think most people don't do this, but I write the piece I love first, then I find the place that it should go. Um, and I make it, ha I just squeeze it in. I make, I make somebody take it <laughs> eventually. That's what I do. I so your, your viral essays, Rebecca, they have all dealt with your personal life. Some of them yeah. have dealt with your mom. Yeah. How do you handle the level of privacy that you want versus the level of self-revelation and vulnerability that a lot of your essays show? How do you yeah. balance those things? It's really hard. I'll tell you something. That's one of the reasons that I ended up um, turning my memoir into a novel because um, during the time I was writing the essays, I didn't think what it would do to my family and my community. I knew that it was going to be tough for them. So my brother says, my brother's very funny. He's like, just 
like a lawyer, you set it all up for us from the day one. I said, I'm going to do this, guys. I'm going to do this. So every week, every week. So they were prepared. I told them I was going to do it. But once you do it, it feels different for your family. They, uh, it's not just about my mother and I. It's every person that knows my mother, her sisters, her friends around the country, my brothers, who that's their mom too, um, cousins, aunts, uncles, friends. So when I did my most personal piece on the Today Show, because I'd written about my mom twice before in the Washington Post and New York Times, the same kind of story, but the Today Show piece was more um, authentic and it, it, it dug a little bit into the hurtful stuff more. Uh, people called her and uh, said, how could, I, how could your daughter do this to you? And she called me crying and she said, people think I'm a monster. And she was bawling and she was crying hard. And I was, I was, I couldn't breathe. And I said, you know, I thought to myself, am I the monster? Like maybe I'm the monster here for writing this. But I, but in the end, you know, a couple hours later, when we both kind of calmed down, she said, no, keep writing, keep writing the stories. Cause this is what you want to do. This is what's healing for you. This is what your, what you want for your life. And I'm your mother and I support you. The thing is, once she said that she, it kind of released me to step back and not be as defensive about what I was doing and writing all those stories. I wrote, you know, I've had over like 21 pieces out in the last couple of years it released some of that need for, I need to tell you my true story. So now I could kind of, it, I felt softened by that. I felt softened by her. I felt healed by her. I felt healed by getting those stories out. And I could take- You're gonna write a, you're gonna write a blog for brevity called I Am The Monster, right? Right, I should. <laughs> it's really hard. It's, I mean, you know how it is. It's, we write our true stories and it affects lots of people. So it's a balancing act, but um, even the immigration one, and I'll tell you another quick story. So the first one is about being an immigrant, right? So I, um, when I uh, came to America, I loved it so much. I wanted everything American. I am a very like patriotic immigrant. And because I thought America is going to give me everything I want to be strong, to be worthwhile as a woman and to be fierce. And I don't want to give anything up having, you know, being a woman, I don't want to. And I thought America will allow me that. So when I became a citizen, um, I was so happy. And I said, you know, I kept thinking though in my heart after 9-11, what if somebody says something to me like go back to your own country or something like that? I would die. I thought I would be, cr I would like crumble. I would disintegrate. Um, and I had, I, this is totally true. I would practice in my mind a speech of what I would say to this person, this imaginary person that didn't want me in their country. And I would practice that speech in my head, ready for anyone to say that to me. That's how scared I was. And for, so for years, I would have, writing about it would have been inconceivable. And then I write my first piece that goes, is a national piece and it goes viral. Four, like Noah said, at least three, four million. You know, he told me three million a couple of years ago, like two years That's ago. That's Noah Michelson at HuffPost. Yeah. And they've republished it. And it went to number one, um, it went to the number one trending story on Apple News. First time it went out and the second time it was published. It was incredible. So at least, you know, millions of people. So you know that inevitably I got those emails. Go back to your own country if you don't like it here. Or, or how dare you, you know, say this and that. And the more I wrote, the more I saw those stories, the first time it crushes you, the second time it hurts you, the third time you laugh a little bit mm -hmm. and you say, that's not a creative answer. That's all you got to say. <laughs> come back, come back to me with something a little more creative than that. Um, so it made me stronger. Yeah. Um, you, we have a question from um, a direct message. Do you work with an editor along the way and how does editing work? 
Such a good question. Oh my gosh. When I started writing, I thought every writer just sat at their desk by themselves and they wrote these pieces or they wrote these uh, novels. And this is where I'm reading. They are brilliant. They're other kinds of humans and I'm another kind of human. And I could never be the, I could never be a writer because how could I be brilliant like that? Not that I'm saying writers aren't brilliant. I'm sure they are, but we all get help. I definitely got help. Um, I would say the majority of my beginning pieces um, uh, Peter read, Peter Mumford. He was um, my teacher at first. And then I emailed him. I said, would you be kind of my mentor? And I hired him uh, on an hourly basis. And if I had an idea, I would write it and I'd send it to him. And, I and I'd say, what do you think? You know, and he'd give me his feedback. And slowly with that, I got to understand how to write a piece well. I mean, better. I mean, well, mm -hmm. who knows? Who knows when I'm going to get to well, but better. And after that, when I stopped, you know, having him um, as a resource, uh, I would read it out loud. David Sedaris says, um, he always says this, and I saw him once and I love him and he was my inspiration. And I, I always wanted to be David Sedaris. Like I thought he is the best. That's the kind of thing I want to write. Make people laugh, make people cry. Oh, is there anything better than that? And I went to the Kennedy Center to see him and I was like, I have to ask him a question. And um, my husband's like, do it, do it. And I stood up in the Q&A and, &A and um, I said, you know, people say you have to have a writing group and because not everybody has a writing group. I don't have a writing group that we read each other's pieces. That's not the kind of writing group I have. I'm just alone in my house. Um, and I said to him, what if you don't have someone to read your piece? What if you don't have a writing group? What do you do? What kind of writing group do you have? He said, I don't have anyone reading my piece, but I read it out loud again and again and again and wow it helps and mm. it's really it's kind of my other person um when I wrote the brevity piece I was at Allison's workshop in Italy it was amazing and I didn't have anybody to read it I didn't give it to anyone but I sat in there and I read it out loud but if I and people say this all the time have another pair of eyes I email friends now if I, if they have time if before my piece goes out and I say, can you just read it and tell me like if there's any spots that don't feel right? So mm -hmm. even if you don't have a writer group, you might have a friend that's a, you know, that reads a lot or a writing friend that can spare a couple minutes and then you read their pieces. And even the process of reading to somebody who is not a writer is helpful. Yes. Like my husband is not a writer, not a reader. When we moved in together, there were seven books in the house total and they were all Game of Thrones. <laughs> and yet I can read him, hey, I'm writing this piece. I want it to say this to writers and I'll read it to him. Number one, the process of reading it out loud with another person there makes me hear what's not working. And he's really good at going, well, have you made the point about what? And often it's something that is very obvious that I haven't thought about because I assume that everybody already knows it. And then I realize, oh, no, 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 not everybody does know this. We we do need to hear this again. And I find that so, so helpful. Rebecca, one of your viral essays led to meeting an editor who is now interested in your book. Tell us how that happened. Yeah, you know, um, it's true. It Not only the editor, but also an agent um, uh, approached me and said she wanted to represent me from that one piece. And she, she ended up reading all my pieces before she contacted me. But so I... Um, this is how it happened. A year and a couple months ago, I was taking Susan Shapira's class and she said, oh, I'm having a panel in New York with editors and publishers. Um, and I don't live in New York. I live in DC. And this is the thing I thought to myself, and I still do a little bit, this is what I want to do. And I'm going to do everything I can. So I jumped on the train, went up to New York for Friday night's panel, like a crazy person. Um, and I just sat at the panel and I thought for sure I'd be able to ask questions during the panel, but she didn't have Q and A's. So it ended and I talked to every single panelist. I just cornered them, you know, and told, asked them questions. And some of them were like, what are you doing? And other, and then this woman, she's a senior VP at uh, Macmillan children's books. I wasn't planning to write a children's book. She said, what do you write? And I told her about that piece that originally, originally Washington Post was going to publish it and they published something like it, but then the original one went into the Today Show. 
And she said, I love, I love mother daughter stories and eating disorders, something that topic is important to me. Send me your piece that night. Everybody was talking to her, but I, I like left her alone. Uh, but I went up and said goodbye just so that I could have another face to face with her. And she said, I want you to email me. And I emailed her the piece. And then she said, you should, I want you to write a children's book about this. And so I turned my memoir into a, um, a um, middle grade, upper middle grade, 10 to 14 years old um, book. And guys, I don't know if I should say this, but she's reviewing it right now. I'm going to hear in two days if, she gonna, if she's going to buy it. Uh, so I wrote the book in a year. Um, she said, come back to me. I got an agent and I wrote the whole thing. and I poured everything into this book, my heart and soul. And we'll see if she doesn't take it, that's business, but that's just, we'll see, but maybe, I, maybe she will. What I love about that story is that, um, well, you're tenacious, so that's great. Um, but that when she asked you to do that, you took her up on it. Yeah. So there's so many opportunities I hear that just kind of flitter away because people don't resubmit or they don't believe that they it's worth even trying. Um, so you can only win when you play. It's true. Exactly. Exactly. Don't say no to yourself before other people say no to you. Siobhan has a great question in the chat. How did you navigate changing the language to suit the age level when you went memoir to middle grade? And I'd also love to know, is there a difference in like language or tone or voice when you're writing a book versus writing an essay? Such a good question. Um, the first thing I did was I just bought as, as, all the middle grade novels I could that had the same theme, mother, daughter, body issues, da, da, da. And I read the ones that, you know, were, and I read them and I read them and read them. The one mistake I made was thinking, oh, if I'm gonna, I'm gonna dumb it down a lot for kids. Kids don't need a dumb down. And I was putting like, like wowzers and, you know, and the first person that read it is like, you need to take all those lame things out. So I actually didn't change it that much. To tell you the truth, I think my writing is a little bit like from a teenager's point of view. Point of view. Um, but what my son said, my son's 18. He said, this is perfect for you. You are kind of like a teenager. Um, anyway, so uh, I, the best thing to do really is read books in that genre. And I want to say one thing that I saw I can't look at the chat just because I'm trying to concentrate on you guys, but Abby said something and it's totally true. Um, I wrote the middle grade book in such a short time because I found someone on the uh, on Twitter. This is what I did. I thought to myself, there's no way I can write a book without some kind of structure. So I went through all the writers on Twitter that I connect with and I talk to. And I found one that was talking about that she was writing a middle grade too. I read her pieces because that's how you do it. Because I wanted to be like a writer I respect and like, and I liked her pieces. She had published in a couple pieces, uh, places, uh, including Half Post. I reached out to her and I said, what do you want to do this with me? And this is my plan. We send each other pages every week. I want to do this fast. And I want to and she said, absolutely. We wrote our books together in about six months and we sent each other pages uh, every week. And what um, Abby said in the comments, which is really true in the chat, I learned so much from reading her work and editing her work. And she would comment on my work. I edited, basically read an entire other person's book in draft form. And I didn't even think about it, but that made me such a better writer because you, when you see somebody doing something that doesn't feel right, sometimes you don't see it in your own writing, but you'll see it in other people's writing. And again and again and again, that's why being a good literary citizen also like helping other people, reading pe people's pieces, not only puts good vibes out there for you, um, kindness out, kindness in, you know what I mean? Um, it also helps you be kind of a better writer. I love that you also had a strategy. You knew where you struggled. Yeah. And you looked for resources and you didn't necessarily look for resources you have to pay for. You looked right. at resources that were accessible to you right then and right now. And I think that's also really important because there's so many problems in the world that money can solve if you have enough of it, right? But not right. all of us have money. Right. So looking at ways that you can make things happen for yourself on the cheap is brilliant advice. That's great. 
So it sounds like you've been writing and publishing a lot. You're also a lawyer and a mom and um, a husband. I've been told is pretty awesome. He um, is so awesome. We had three <laughs> husbands with us on the Tuscany retreat last year. And Rich was such a pleasure to have around and so funny. And two of our three husbands were like shaved headed guys too. So it was like, true. who's that bald guy? Oh, he's with us. <laughs> bald true. crew. Yeah. So with all that going on, how do you balance your time? How do you get it all done? It's, um, you know, the thing is, because my kids are older and my husband really, he likes his career. I needed this for many years. I didn't have something that I passionately wanted. And this is what I passionately wanted. But things um, fell by the wayside. I used to cook dinner every night. I don't. Um, I just don't do it. I don't have time or energy. I have, uh, I give like so much of myself during the day to my writing, to my writing community who I love, love, love. And when I do that a couple hours, uh, you know, let's say four or five hours a day, I am beat. There's no way I want to cook dinner. So some certain things had to change in my life. And my 17 year old wasn't thrilled that I wasn't making dinner every night. But um, I told him, your mom's doing something else and he's very proud, but he still wants dinner. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I've said this to other writers too. remember modeling dedication and focus right. to something you care about is also excellent parenting. Keep yes. going, Rebecca. <laughs> and I'll say something I just saw. What is my schedule? You know, Allison did a pitch um, a class and she had, I don't know if you did it in your pitch class. You had, um, oh no, writing fast. Your the writing pie chart. Fast. Yes, of your schedule. I love that. I actually, um, my schedule has a lot to do with Allison. Allison has a co-writing um, Zoom. It's free. Anyone can be on it. And it's every day of the, you know, five days a week, Monday to Friday. So I center my writing around that. It's Eastern time, 1230 to um, two. And 2 then usually, yep. usually like Judith, who I love, or somebody else, Allison, the other Allison or Miriam, they take it for another hour. So that's two and a half hours of writing. That's a solid block of writing. So I, um, I tell myself, whatever you're doing, errands and everything in the morning, by that time, be at your desk and, and say hello to everyone and write. So I write, I try to write when I'm writing my book or essays, I write three, four hours a day. You know, some of that is reading, some of that is editing, but, um, and then when I'm not writing, I don't do anything. <laughs> so it's like an all or nothing kind of thing. It's like, I'm very intense with my stuff. How do you balance when you're pitching versus when you're writing? Because those are two like oh. mentally really different processes. Yeah, I can't do it. I When I'm writing the book, I have to concentrate on the book. And, and we've talked about this in my writing group with friends. Um, and I advise, I like give advice now a, a lot. I'm very, I'm very advicey uh, of an advicey kind of friend, but um, you cannot finish your book if you are trying to do a hundred other things in terms of writing. If you want to finish a book, concentrate on the book and be in it and do it. So when I finished my book and I sent it off to the agent a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, um, I immediately was like, okay, now uh, I want to write a piece because writing a piece for me, it even though it might not take that many hours, I'm thinking about the structure of it all the time from the minute I wake up to the minute I go to sleep all of it. And it, it takes a lot. It takes a lot of like energy and life. Um, so I really compartmentalize. If I'm pitching, I'm pitching. And if I'm writing a book, I'm writing. I can't do both because it takes my attention away. When you send off this draft, um, and I, I guess this would also work with when you're, when you send off a first, what you're writing to, from mm -hmm. a pitch, are you like, this is the absolute best I can do? Are you like, this is good enough for now, or mm -hmm. um, this is going to need help, but we're on a time limit. What do you think? That's a good question. You know what? I think the one of the biggest mistakes I have made um, in terms of pitching is doing it too, too soon, being impatient, unless it's timely, then you got to get it out. Uh, but even timely pieces, um, I think I said this in our co-writing group, um, when I write a piece now, I force myself to wait a day 
and read it again the next day out loud. Um, the piece has to be excellent before it goes out. Um, and you just, it, you know, it doesn't resonate if it's, if it doesn't have all the pieces. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that tomorrow. I do personal essays. I've done reported. That's different. That takes weeks. You have to interview people. There's, you know, you have to look at studies and stuff, but if you're writing a personal essay, there's a structure to it. And I never wanted to believe that. And I, the classes I took at the beginning is like read other people's read pieces that are beautiful online from publications you love and see the structure of how it's done and think about how, you know, that you can mimic that in a way. I never did it like formally, but I realized mm -hmm. at the end, there's got to be there's got to be a gut punch at the end. There's got to be a heartfelt at the end. So hard to do. Endings are so important to getting your piece in bigger, you know, big publications or the best literary magazines. It's always the same. That beginning and end is so important. And it's something we don't, it's, it's you have to learn to do. It's not, in, I don't think it's like just comes easily when you ha you're not a writer for 20 years, you know? Mm-hmm. I agree. And one of the things that I want to advise people as far as writing craft is think about this idea of you open the loop and you either close the loop or you deliberately and obviously do not close the loop. So either there is resolution or there is active non-resolution slash change of direction. And so think about, and this usually happens after the first draft, you look back and you go, okay, what's the overall thing I'm saying here? in this book, in this essay, in this article. And now how do I open that question at the very beginning of the piece? And how do I answer that question at the end of the piece? And it's not literally, here's what I'm trying to say. That's what I said. It's more like uh, the first time my mother ever told me I was fat was here. And then you end with the closer of now I know I'm not fat or the story that shows I joyfully wore my bikini to the barbecue and loved myself. You know, it's a, it, that's a very simplistic example, but you get the idea of what I'm saying. Open the loop, close the loop and, and think about how you can do that. Um, we had a question messaged in email. Does it matter if a pitch is personalized? And I bet you're going to talk about this a lot more in Craft Talks tomorrow. But for example, do I have to open the email with, I love reading the Hackensack Bugle and thought your recent article on earwax was amazing? You know, or or how do you open a pitch? You do know you what? have to say something nice? Yeah. I never said that before I took Susan's class because that's she, you know, she talks about that. And I think there's a lot to that to say to the um, editor that you're emailing, you know their publication and you appreciate something they've published. It doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes I say, which I'm thinking of doing with Shannon Palace, I love her. She's never published any of my pieces, but you know what, in the next couple of months, um, at Slate, she's amazing. Um, I kind of like fangirl out with editors that I admire. So anyway, um, sometimes you can say, which I've done this before. You're the only person. You're you're the first person I'm emailing about this because I loved that piece that you did. That's so similar and it meant something to me. You can be personal about that. The problem is they, I, and I'm telling you this, and it's I didn't realize these editors are getting thousands of emails a week. Sometimes they'll never even see your email. They won't open it. Somebody told me this early on, and I and I was like, that can't be. And I, I'm not talking about all editors and I don't, they delete it without opening it. If the subject line is not something that grabs them. So mm -hmm. you can't, it's not a guarantee that they're going to read your whole thing. That, that subject line has to be something that they're looking for, something that grabs their attention. That's why I'm going to talk about that. That title is so important. So you can be personal, but keep it short, keep it tight, keep it professional. Mm. So um, looking in the chat, seeing if there's any questions. Did I miss anything, Allison, in the questions? 
No, I think this is totally amazing. I think we're going to pop into some breakout rooms for a couple minutes. Remember, everybody, breakout rooms are never as freaky as you think they're going to be. We've had a lot of people meet people who they ended up pitching to, hanging out with, bonding as writers. You don't have to join it if you don't want to join it. We'll just pop you into breakout rooms for about five minutes. Do you think of yourself as an emerging writer or why or why not? Talk about that. We'll bring you back in five minutes and we're going to give you our top tips when you come back about the number three things that you can do today to help yourself as an emerging writer. And if you don't want to jump into those breakout rooms, that is A-OK. -okay. If you are watching this on the YouTube archives, now is a great time to add any questions you have uh, to the comment -ish place because we do get notifications of those comments and we will go ahead and uh, answer them as soon as we see them. Sharla, will you tell us a little bit more about what's coming up on Craft Talks while I pop people into breakout rooms? Sure, no problem. You go ahead and open up my share screen and i'm just gonna make sure nobody is alone fantastic and those of you who are still here uh please do go ahead and uh let us know uh do you have any questions go ahead and pop those into the chat awesome and i'm just checking through making sure nobody sure. is by themselves i think everyone can see my screen right now i'm gonna just open up the calendar real quick so of course, we talked a lot about this when we have writing for commercial publications. That's with Rebecca. That's tomorrow. Um, Does it have to be memoir is with Beth Kephart. I talked a little bit about this. Just something to let you know about it is early bird right now. It's $15 and it's really about whether or not, you know, when you're writing your memoir and you're like, I have a temptation to make this fiction and whether you should do that or not or some options for you, some flexible forms. We have Allison doing The Secret of Structure, Shaping Your Powerful Publishable Novel or Memoir. So we didn't even mention that. And um, it's really, I've been asked a lot for more inf more craft talks about the second draft. And this is a great one to join for that. Um, Allison is going to do that one. I have, sorry, I have a question here. Awesome. Okay. I'm just scrolling through and trying to save people from being all by themselves. If you're still with us here, it means you joined after I set up the, the breakout room. So please do go ahead and ask us any questions you currently want to ask us, because I'm probably not going to be able to get all of you into a room. So I do want to like make sure that you are not left totally alone in here. Please do feel free to ask us more questions. Diana has a question. Allison, you probably would have a better answer than I would, but how about pay schedule for essay writing these days? Is it stable? Is it by the piece or is it by the word? Do you know? I'm just going to say that in Little Women, Joe March got paid the princely sum of $50 for her essay in 1868, and that's still what we're getting paid. Um, mm -hmm. Generally these days, don't worry too much about what you're going to get paid for the actual uh, essay you're far more likely to be able to use it in terms of um, how do you how do you use it to promote your own work? How do you use it to share your work on social media because it gives you something to talk about? How does it help leverage you in the in the public sphere? And how does it let you talk about something that's really important for you to talk about? Um, there's a question also. Do you know, Allison, is there a fiction magazine, like a thriller magazine that actually pays to publish work? I don't know because that's kind of out of my realm. Mm -hmm. um, but I do know there are a lot of literary magazines that publish fiction. And there are a lot of uh, genre magazines that publish fiction that are places that you can share your work. Um, really, that's a, a plan of like, you know, read widely and do everything you can to be aware of what's going on in your genre, what kind of magazines are existing out there. I have to say that not many magazines pay. Um, commercial magazines, yes. Genre magazines, not so much. What they do offer is um, readership and the opportunity to possibly um, be catch the eye of an agent. I know, for example, if you're a sci-fi writer, you get part of, you have the opportunity to join um, a more prestigious club if you get published in, and that helps establish you for some prizes, uh, like the Hugo Award, you have to have that club credential. But um, it's not, like someone said, not a great way to earn a living by itself. 
but it can help you in other areas if you want to say reach out to an agent so showing all the places that you've been published already giving you some credibility showing that you know how to work with an editor and those sort of things exactly it's really not a way to make a living it's a way to have some nice fun money and i find too that it's a really good way to finish a piece that is kind of lurking around in my head. Uh, like for example, Slate uh, and Rebecca mentioned uh, Re uh, Shannon Paulus as an editor there. Slate has an interesting feature called One Thing that's about like some weird quirky tip that they think people should do. And I, I came up with two ideas for one thing after reading it for a while. And I wanna go ahead and and share that uh, share that with the world. So it's, it's giving me a reason, it's giving me an excuse to go ahead and write and finish an essay. Hey, Abby, you're here with us. And Abby, I know you do a lot of publishing of essays. Will you tell us, fill us in on what your process is like? Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I started writing essays uh, during the pandemic. Um, you know, similar to Rebecca, I, I started out actually with a group called the Isolation Journals, which is Suleika Jawad's um, global writing project where she, uh, it was originally intended to be a 30 day project during the pandemic lockdown where she would post a writing prompt, a journaling prompt every day. And then you had the option of writing to that prompt and sharing your writing on a private Facebook group. Um, that's when I kind of found my voice. I was doing professional um, copywriting, marketing writing, that kind of things um, for hospital systems for, you know, 20 years prior to that. So I have writing experience, but not personal writing experience. And um, like Rebecca, I took a course. I took Sue Shapiro's course. I joined, you know, various Facebook private writing groups for women that most of us know about. And, um, you know, just built from there and just kept learning more, trying more, experienced major FOMO and just wanted to try everything. Um, one of the first publications I was in was um, Wired Magazine. I never thought I'd do technical writing, but I, I had an idea for an essay about um, finding good IT support when you work from home. You know, it was just based on, um, <clears throat> excuse me, an experience that I had when my whole system died suddenly um, during the pandemic when equipment was not available readily, but because the way my IT guy had set me up with backup systems, I was protected and how important it is to have that support. So. Um, so what you know, was going on in your life was a great opportunity to think, how do I want to share this with other people? Exactly. Um, but I, you know, I'm forgetting the question because I'm rambling. What was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> That's all good. We have another great question in the chat as people come back from breakout rooms. Welcome back. Deborah Lucas asks in the chat, should we try to get into print journals and publications or will online journals give us the same boost on our resume? Generally, these days, online will boost you more. It is seen by many more people. It is much easier for you to share it. You don't have to wait for that magazine copy to come in the mail and then decide who gets your three magic copies and is your mother going to be one of them. Um, and what I will say too, though, is if you are, and, and Anne, who's our digital strategist uh, guru, says online is great for search engine as well, for people looking for you. The one time you want to look for print magazines, print journals, is if you, you are a literary writer, in which case there are agents who specialize in literary work who are looking for pieces in the journals that they subscribe to. And in that case, you want to look for one of those lists of the magazines that get their pieces into Best American Essays so that you can get into legit big deal magazines if you are a literary writer, if your work is voice forward, language forward, lyrical, not at all the kind of piece that can be headlined on a website. So welcome back from breakout rooms, everybody. Uh, we are going to share with you our very top tips. Sharla, before we take our closing moments here, what's happening in Craft Talks tomorrow again? Have you guys forgotten already? <laughs> this is going to be with <laughs> Rebecca Morrison. She's going to help us learn how to pitch for commercial publications. Um, as you can tell, she has a lot to tell us. So if you're interested, be sure to join at craft-talks.com or email me and I'll give you the link and also pop it into the chat as well. And there's a lot more coming up as well. So 
Keep your eye Fantastic. out. Fantastic. And uh, check your Writer's Bridge email for which you got this link. And uh, in there is going to be your $50 off code for coming to Proposal Bootcamp April 12th through 15th. So emerging writers, are we, can we, do we, how, what are our top tips? Sharla, what's something a writer can do today to help them emerge as a writer? So I thought about this question for quite a while. And um, I think what I what I wanted to say is that we've all compared ourselves to others to make sure we're on the right track, that we belong. Maybe some of you are meant to feel encouraged today, feel discouraged because you compared yourself to Rebecca's success. And as I've been in the emerging writer position for a while, I've had my own come to Jesus moments quite a few times. In those moments, I had to decide why is it that I'm still writing and how do I personally measure my success versus how other people measure success? What is it that I want? And what am I going to do to get there? I commend Rebecca for continuing to put herself out there and doing things even if they're slightly uncomfortable. I think that's important. Ultimately, my advice for emerging writers as myself is to decide for yourself what you want and why and to then be tenacious and allow yourself a lot of hubris because it takes a lot of hubris to keep putting yourself out there. Yeah, Rebecca, what is your top tip today for what people should do to emerge as a writer? You know, I I really, and I, first your stories matter, so keep going. All of our stories matter. People say, but I didn't have a big tragedy in my life or I didn't have, you know, something huge. I didn't, the truth is the tiniest stories make an enormous difference in somebody else's life. Um, and you get that story out, even if it's one person that sees it and it changes them, it's worth it your story is worth it. And the other thing I would say is totally different is I, I, I know social media is a garbage dump of like a lot of bad stuff, but it's also this beautiful, joyous, um, supportive community. If you find, um, your writing people, find your people and rejoice in their support and give them love. And it'll be a big, big boost to your writing life. Absolutely. Uh, it's like that beautiful poem by Sean Thomas Doherty. Why bother? Because right now there is someone out there with a wound in the exact shape of your words. As you move into your writing lives today, tomorrow, the rest of the week, remember, don't say no to yourself before other people say no to you. It is always good to thrust yourself forward and start playing tennis with better tennis players. Look for writers who are going to drive you, who are going to inspire you, who are going to help you move forward because your words are worth it and you are worth it. We will see you again next month uh, at the Writer's Bridge, which is probably podcasts, but maybe it's email lists. We'll find out. It's going to be an exciting surprise for all of us. We hope to see many of you tomorrow at Craft Talks for Rebecca Morrison's Craft Talk, getting your work into commercial media, um, all about pitching, all about the process. Rebecca, thank you so much for spending your time here with us today. You are just amazing. And everybody, please unmute yourselves for a joyful goodbye. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you. 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 Bye, everyone. It was so awesome. I really loved it. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to do this. Yes. It was wonderful. Okay. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you. Thank you. Yay. Hey, Courtney, you look like you have an extra question.